Hello, good day. This is Job Agwas once again, and welcome to my lectures in Philosophical Anthropology. And this is now the second part of our first topic, uh, the first lecture, uh, Man as Being and Subject. So in this second part, we're going to discuss uh, about uh, the dignity of the human person, his uniqueness, uh, his relationship with the world, and his lived experiences. In the previous discussion, or in the in the first part of this lecture, I focus on uh, the notion of being, and then on the notion of the human person. And we have said that the human person is composed of the body and the soul. Uh, it is the soul, or the rational soul, or the spirit, that gives, uh, or that animates the body, and it is the source of our spiritual capacities, or the faculties. Okay. Uh, the faculties of intelligence and the faculty, uh, the faculties of intelligence and of the will, and it is actually the spiritual component, our spiritual soul or our spirit, that makes us a person. Because of course, together with the other beings, we also share with them our, or we also share a physical component of our being, our body. Okay, but it is our being a spirit that really makes us a Person. So, man is not just composed of the body and the soul. He is composed of both the spiritual and the corporeal, uh, corporeal components, the spirit and the body. And according to Karol Vitiwa or St. John Paul II, the relationship between the body and the soul is of utmost importance. Okay? It is important in the understanding of the whole uniqueness of the person. So, uh, according to him, it is because we have a body and spirit that we are different from all other creatures. We are unique from all other creatures of God. And because of this, as human persons, we occupy a special place in the whole of creation of God. Because of our spirituality, we are images of God. We were created in the image and likeness of God. We are Imago Dei. So, uh, because we have this spirit, and God is a spirit, we are endowed with the two important faculties. We can reason and we can will. We have the power of intelligence. We have the power of volition or choice. Okay, That's why we are like image or likeness of God. And that is actually where our dignity as human persons is based. We have our own self-worth because we were created in the image and likeness of God. Uh, and uh, nobody can take away that dignity, not even man himself, because it is a dignity or a value that is given by God. So, of course, that dignity of the person, or dignity as a human person, is different from uh, his other values. That inherent value of the dignity of the person is different, for example, from his moral value. Because the moral value now talks about what you do good or, what, or whatever you do, whether it is good or evil. So you become an evil, you, you can become a good moral person or a bad or an immoral person but as a person whether you do good or bad that dignity as a human person as an image of god remains nobody can take that away not even yourself of course you become a good person a moral person when you do good acts and you become a bad person when you do bad actions or bad behavior. So, because we are human persons, we are regarded as somebody. Okay, We are somebody. Uh, what is this somebody? Well, to distinguish us from objects. Okay, To distinguish us from objects. Because we are the only entity, as we have already said, we are the only entity in the world okay, who can think who can understand, 
who can be aware of himself who can be yes we have self consciousness as we have said we have our own interiority and we are aware of our own interiority okay so we are differentiated from the other objective entities this is our distinctive characteristics or character as a person okay? person is distinguished from all other entities even from the most advanced animals because of his specific inner self he has an inner life that is characteristic only of the human person nobody in this world has an inner life except the human person okay well the other beings may have life they may have uh, uh, they may have their own desires they may have their you know their senses like the animals but only man has a spiritual life okay so uh, we are the most unique not just the most unique we are the most special being in the world most special and most unique being in the world okay now let's move now to the relation of the human person to the world now remember that we have said that man is composed of body and soul okay and our spirit our spirit is the source of our intentions our inner life is the source of our intentions of our thoughts right and this sources or this inner life can actually be communicated with the outside world okay of course our contact with the outside world starts with the physical or the natural and sensitive uh, sensitive uh, you know sensitive component and what is this sensitive what is the basis of our sensitive or sensual component well nothing else but the body okay so I have my intentions I have my thoughts I have my wishes I have my intelligence I have my knowledge but how do I share how do i relate these things with the outside world it is through our or my body it is through our body okay so it is through the body that we can relate and we can also impart our inner life with the world okay so for example it is through our hands that we are able to relate with physical objects it is through my hands that I can manipulate, you know, this, this laptop or my cell phone or books or anything, any gadget, any object, okay? It is also through the eyes that uh, we are able to see the objects in front of us. It is also through our ears that we can hear. So, uh, it is through the physical object that we establish contact with the outside world. And it's, it is also through our senses that we are, are able to express our inner self, our inner life, our thoughts, our intentions, our knowledge, etc. Okay? So, it is through our body that we receive and it is through also through the body that we are able to impart. Okay? Now, let's focus on the receiving of the impression. Because the impressions that we get, the messages that we receive uh, from external reality that uh, pass, uh, that pass through our senses, like for example, the things that we see, that we see, the things that we hear, the things that we feel, it's, it's, it's on and so on, and so on and so forth, right? They are received, okay, they are received and processed by our internal faculties, by our spiritual faculties in the first place, okay? So, as persons, we do not just react to impressions outside of us. Or to the images from the external world like in a spontaneous or purely mechanical manner we react to them according to our spiritual and rational nature and of course this nature includes the power of reason and the power of self-determination which is based on our reason and will or intellect and will our reception and uh, Reactions to these external realities 
that are received by us through our senses are also determined by our reason and will. And there may be several voices to listen to when we are outside or even in a classroom, for example, or there are many things that we can, you know, we can see. Or for example, when you browse through the internet, there are many things that you see. But we choose what voice, what sounds, what impressions to receive. We choose what voice to listen to. Okay? We choose what uh, data or images or video in the internet we want to watch. Okay? So, it's us who process them and it's also us who determines what we are going to, you know, what we are going to absorb, what we are going to get. Okay? So, there may be several instruments in front of us, gadgets in front of us, but it is us who will determine who, what gadgets, what, uh, you know, what, what instruments we are going to use. Okay? Or, for example, uh, you have several lessons, you have several subjects, uh, many, many lectures that you need to listen to, but it is us who will, uh, you know, decide what to study, what to, what to review. So, we determine our actions. So, we are not just like, you know, we are not just like machines that whatever is inputted or put inside, then the, the machine is already pre-programmed, predetermined what to do with the data or with the impressions. As human persons, we process first the things that we receive through our senses. We make our own, you know, understanding of them, our own interpretations. And then we choose, we determine what are we going to do with it. Machines cannot do that. Only persons can do that. Okay? So, we determine ourselves. And as such, because we determine ourselves, we are the masters of ourselves. We are unique individuals and no one can determine our lives except us. Okay? That's how we are unique. And that's how we relate with the world. Of course, we relate with the world, with the body, with the organs, and with the you know faculties of the body, with the senses, etc., etc. We are able to relate with the world through our hands, through our body parts, you know, through the body in general. But how we are going to process all of this will depend on us. And how we are going to conduct our lives, live our lives, do our jobs in relation to this, in relation to the world, is determined by us. So we are sui uh, juris. We are the masters of our selves. Okay? We determine what we are going to be, what we are going to do. All right, now. Let's go on to the next topic, the irreducibility of the human person. Okay. So, what do you mean by to be irreducible? Well, to be irreducible is not to be reduced to something. Okay? Not to be reduced to something. Well, what does it mean? Now, first, we have said that we are part of the world, right? Because we have a body. We relate with the objects of the world. But we cannot be considered only as a part of the many objects of the world. Yes, we, we, we exist in the world. We are a part of the world. Uh, we communicate and we relate with the objects of the world, but we are different from them. And we cannot be reduced to their level. We cannot be reduced to mere physical objects or bodily objects. We are not like animals. Okay? So, why is that? Because we are, we have, as we have already mentioned, we are human subjects, we have the spirit. And as such, we are unique and unrepeatable. Okay? So that means we cannot be reduced to the level of the world. This is what uh, philosophers would call, especially uh, John Paul II or Carol Witty, who asked the 
level of the cosmos, the cosmological level. We cannot be reduced, okay, to the cosmological level. Okay, so the irreducibility is that which is essential in us, and it con constitutes the entire originality of the human person in the world. The, although he is in the world, he cannot be reduced to the level of the world. Okay? He cannot be reduced to the cosmological level. Now, according to Voitiwa, or again, John Paul II, the conception of a man as belonging to the genera of animality simply makes man as one of the objects of the world, and it fails to grasp man or the human person as a subject. So that is the understanding of man in the cosmological level, reducing us to the level of the world. Okay? So such conception reduces and lowers man to the level of the animals. Yes, we are, we share with the animals certain qualities, certain power, certain, you know, uh, operations. But because of our reason, which is based on our spirituality, our, our spirit being created in the image of likeness of God, and therefore we cannot be reduced to the level of the world. Okay? So we are subjects. We are personal subjects. And this being personal subject is irreducible. It is original. Okay? So uh, even if we say man is a rational animal, that animality cannot be reduced to the level of the ordinary animals. Okay? As human beings, we are not just a being defined according to certain species. We are ourselves. We are concrete, self-conscious, rational, spiritual subjects. Okay, so according to Vitiwa, the proper understanding of man should be that man is a person. It should be a, uh, you know, uh, said it must be personalistic. It must focus on the personal, on the inner subject. Okay, the inner aspect of the human being. There is a need to understand, therefore, that mode of being, of being personal, which is proper to the human person. He is an individualized human. He is a human person with dignity. Right? And therefore, we, can, we should never reduce the human person to the level of the animals. We should always respect his dignity, and his worth okay now let's move on now to the next topic man's lived experience what is this lived experience um for for Voitiwa or John Paul II in order to understand man as this unique and unrepeatable subject he introduces the notion of lived experience okay now, of course, the notion of lived experience is not something that is unique to Vitiwa because that is a notion that is common to many existentialist and phenomenological philosophers. Now, but what is the this idea of lived experience? First, as a human being, we have our senses, right? Sense of sight, sense of hearing, sense of taste, etc., etc. So, we can be considered as a sensing and perceiving subject. Is an experiencing subject. Okay, but the lived experience is different. Because when you say lived experience, it means your own personal experience. Okay. So he is not just somebody who, for example, looks at this laptop or looks at people or experiences the weather or experiences, for example, uh, you know music or listens to music he yes he, he can do all these things but when you say live experience it is a kind of experience that is personal okay so let's have for example when you say personal it is something that is really uh, his own personal experience let's have an example uh Suppose two people, two persons enters, they enter a church. So the first, let's say uh, the person A, uh, the first person is, say, uh, 
a tourist. Okay? And he enters the church because he wanted to see the beautiful altar inside the church. So when he enters the church, he sees this beautiful you know, design of the altar. He's very fascinated with the colors, very fascinated with the design, everything. Very fascinating, very beautiful, very pleasing to the eye. Okay, So he experiences the church through his senses. Okay, Now, the second person enters the church, and let's say this person is a believer or, well, a parishioner who enters the church in order to pray. Okay, So, of course, if he focuses on the altar, the beauty of the altar, he can also see the beauty of the altar, the different colors, the beautiful design, etc., etc. But he enters there as a believer, as a worshiper. So he will experience a different thing. He will experience the spiritual. He will experience the, the presence of God. Okay? The divine presence of God. So he will experience this no, he will pray, he will have his own live experience. Now, another parishioner may have entered. And he may have, you know, the same experience as the first parishioner. But he will have a different experience altogether. Because if the first parishioner, the second one who enters, prays, for example, for uh, to thank God for the blessings that he received, that will be a different experience. And suppose the third person who enters has a very big and heavy problem. He will have a different experience of the divine, of the spiritual, of the presence of God. You see, this is now different lived experience. Okay? These are different lived experience. And this experience originates from within. Okay? It originates from the very core of the person. So that's the meaning of live experience. So for example, uh, what is your experience of love? What is your experience of friendship? Okay? So two people may be experiencing one and the same thing. We may be there looking sensibly, you know, perception. They may be perceiving the same thing, but they're going to have different live experiences. You see, you, you are listening to one in the same lecture, right? You are listening to one in the same voice. So you have the same sense experience. But how the lecture is received by you is received according to your personal experiences. And that's your lived experience. It is an experience that is unique. And this the, 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 our own lived experiences okay, reveals the kind of person we are. Okay? And that reveals our uniqueness. That reveals our unrepeatability. Why? Because we have our own loving. We have our own uh, relationship with the divine, with God. We worship God differently. We talk to God differently. Okay? Our problems, our hurts, our worries are different. These are all part of our lived experience. Okay? So, our subjectivity is unique. It is personal. Okay? So, any activity that originates from our subjectivity is also personal. Because, well, again, we go back to our the idea of uh, lived experience. We have different lived experience. You see, even if, for example, we play, for those of you who are familiar or are, are the, who, who love uh, to play basketball, we may have, you know, the same knowledge, the same, you know, when, when, you, when you watch a basketball game, for example. But your experience of the game is different. See, if you're two friends watching a basketball game together, so they're looking at the same basketball game. 
But at the end of the game, one is if they are rooting for the two dif to, to the different two different teams. After the game, one is happy. The other one is sad. They have different lived experiences about the game. Okay. So again, our lived experience cannot be you know cannot be reduced. To, you, you cannot just generalize. You cannot just categorize this lived experience because they are deeply personal. And they disclose our uh, subjectivity, okay, to others especially. Okay, now let's move on to the next. And this is the last part of this discussion, individuality and personality, right? <clears throat> so here we are going to uh, follow the idea or the thoughts of the French philosopher Jacques Maritain. According to the French philosopher Jacques Maritain, the human being, the human person, is caught between two poles. A rational pole, which is called individuality. I'm sorry, uh, a material, sorry, a material pole, which is materiality. And the spiritual pole, which he calls personality. So we are both an individual and personal. Okay? But these are just two poles. Uh, we don't separate the human person into an individual and to a person. Okay? There's only one subject, that's the human person. Only that there are two poles, the material and the spiritual, the individual and the personal. Okay? Well, because this is, again, coming from the idea that we are composed of the corporeal and the spiritual of the body and the soul. So, individuality signifies our unity and simplicity. Okay, what does it mean by that? As we have said, every being is a substance, right? It is an individual substance. So, the spiritual substances like the angels, the individual substances, and the others like God, you no, know, is the most perfect individual. The spiritual substances, God and the angels, they are the perfect spirituals. Material beings or material substances, on the other hand, are quite different. Because, according to St. Thomas, their individuality is rooted or based in matter. That means it is based in the fact that they are physical beings. So material beings require the occupation in space of a position distinct from every other position. Okay, so we, so as, as physical beings, for example, I am seated on my chair. So I, I am occupying this particular space. And of course, nobody can occupy this space that I am sitting on. All right? Of course, that reminds us of one of the properties of matter. Right? So... <clears throat> Uh, now, the human person, as we have explained, is not just a physical thing or just a mere body. I'm not just a body sitting on a chair. I have a soul or a spirit united to my body. So, the spirit and the body are the two substantial co-principles of one and the same being. Of one and the same reality and that is the human being the human person or man okay so every soul is indebted to animate and give life to a particular body and the body receives its physicality from the cells which is you know uh, determined by our heredity of a particular no a particular well based on our genes right now, since the soul has a substantial relation to a particular body, then it also requires the individual characteristics that differentiate it from the other human souls. So, my soul is different from, this, from your soul, from the soul of other people, precisely because it is substantially related to only one particular body. Okay? So, there, again, it explains the, uh, you know, the the uniqueness of the human person. Okay? So 
the our individuality is based on our body. It's our body that individuates us, that makes us this particular person. Okay? And the soul is also uh, unique in the sense that it is it is joined substantially to one particular body. Okay? Now, next go to the personality. So personality signifies our interiority, the interiority of the self, which is derived from its being spiritual and therefore it also signifies an inherent dignity as image of God, as we have already mentioned. That is why man is not just a human individual, not composed of a body that is substantially related to the soul. He is also a person, a human person. More than just a physical being, man is a spiritual being because of his spiritual nature being again created in the image and likeness of so while individuality signifies man's being part of the world, being a fragment of the universe, and a determinate being in a physical world, because of course he's part of the, you know, the nature of the physical nature of the world. The human person, you know, as a human person, he has, he is also a spiritual being because of his spirit, of course, and he has the capacity to be creative, you know, to be intelligent, to be free, etc. So he has this creative capacity or the this capacity of creative unity, the capacity for intelligence, the capacity for free will and freedom. So individuality and personality explains the uh, materiality or the, yeah, yes, the the materiality or corporeality and the spirituality of the human person. Now, we should not equate materiality with something that is evil or something bad. It's not because the material is not bad in itself. It is good in itself in so far as it is part of our created existence. And when we properly relate this materiality, our physicality, our body, to our personality or to our spirit, then we really become a morally good human person. Why? Because as truly, truly human persons, when we are truly human persons, when the life of the spirit and of freedom reigns over that of the senses and passion, because the body has its own senses and passion, right? And feelings. But you have to allow our spirit to govern, to reign over our senses and passion. All right? Because if a person allows himself to develop only the material individuality and ignore personality, ignore his spirit, his conscience, you know, his intellect, his will, then he will gravitate towards the ego, which is actually selfish. So, the person aspires towards spiritual growth of the general self and is ordained upward to saintly pursuit. It is oriented towards God, who is his ultimate end. So, the deepest layer of human person's dignity consists in its propensity to resemble, to resemble God because He actually was created resembling God. He's the image and likeness of God. Of course, the human body is still part of God's creation, but over and above our body, we have a spirit, which is actually the basis of our dignity as human person. And that image Okay, the dignity, that value of the human person is based on the fact that we are created in the image and likeness of God. And therefore, our ultimate goal is to resemble God. So, thank you very much for listening. That ends the second part of this lecture.
what's output the third and last part of this lecture.